Okay, well, it's hard to follow such a thought-provoking presentation without uh, telling some stories as well. Um, and I guess I'll do that uh, because I have the floor. So one of my pet peeves, and I, I'll give two examples. Let me first tell you what, what I will say in a, a short, shorter period of time than Bilal this morning. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the global context for protected areas. Town did much of that for us. But I'm going to very briefly go back and touch on some things that I'd like to emphasize from what Town said. Uh, then I'm going to give two examples, actually, one from Madagascar and one from Botswana. And um, to illustrate two different sorts of points about protected areas and their administration. Um, but the story that Bilal's presentation brought to my mind was uh, being in Botswana uh, 20 years ago, I suppose, almost now. And um, Botswana has a very healthy elephant population, one of the few countries that has a, a, a really healthy elephant population. And in fact, they had so many elephants that they were planning to cull elephants. So they've been busily spending lots of money keeping anyone else from shooting their elephants. But the wildlife department had a few people in it who actually wanted to go out and shoot big animals. And so when they had a lot of elephants, they said, well, it's time for us to go out and cull elephants to reduce the, the herd. And their reasoning behind that, and the thing that finally triggered an elephant call conducted by the Department of Wildlife in Botswana, was the fact that elephants were coming in around Kasani, the town in the northern north of Botswana, and pushing over 100-year-old trees. So there were these big trees that people loved, but the elephants were coming in and they were pushing over the trees. And so this created a public outcry. The wildlife department said, oh, we can't have elephants pushing over 100-year-old trees. And so they went and they killed some elephants to reduce the number of elephants in Botswana. Well, the irony of the whole thing was the reason those 100-year-old trees existed around Kasani was because there'd been a big period of over-exploitation of wildlife in the early 1900s. So at exactly those t the time that those trees began to grow, elephants had been shot out all across that part of Africa. And in fact, one of the reasons that the Kalahari Game Reserve and other protected areas were established was because of this indiscriminate destruction of wildlife, including elephants. So ironically, when there were no elephants on the land, the trees grew up and became big trees that were beloved by people. The elephants came back, pushed those trees over. People got upset because trees that they loved were disappearing. And the wildlife department went out and killed some more elephants. So it's not necessarily a, uh, an uplifting story, but it's sometimes frustrating to look at this short memory of people and people taking actions without really thinking about, uh, about the history of the situation. But regardless of history, one of the things we're certainly dealing with is a world that's more and more crowded. And so that's the first thing I want to talk about. So uh, whether or not they, they should have been culling elephants because of that particular reason, it's certainly true that in the past, elephants were able to move over large areas and they're increasingly coming into conflict with people uh, as human population grows and human land uses increase. So there's a reckoning time, and we're in it now for elephants, because elephants can't move across the landscape in the way that they used to. And as a result, when they get restricted to smaller areas, they can do a lot of damage to vegetation. And so there are some serious problems to do with elephant um, management. Uh, because elephants can no longer destroy vegetation in one area and then go out and let re vegetation recover. And um, people are going to have to figure out how to manage that in completely new ways because there just isn't going to be the amount of area available that there used to be for elephants and many other large mammals. Um, and so that's what this graph back here is about. And this is going back to a chart that Bilal put up on the first day in the symposium. And uh, this is very schematic, <laughs> but if you remember his chart, this curve here is the institution of protected areas. And he said, as we just mentioned, there are 100, over 100,000 protected areas in the world. So this is the number of protected areas in the world. And uh, probably the dimensions are a little long, but there was a long period of a slight increase in protected areas, a big uptake in protected area establishment in the last 30 years, and then recently a decline this isn't the decline in overall number of protected areas. This is a decline in protected area establishment. So it means we're establishing less protected areas now. 
And so the line is the number of protected areas. The columns under it is the uh, new protected areas being established, the area of them. And both of those things, the number of new protected areas and the area being established, are going down globally. And so the part of the curve that we're in is right out here. And there's a reason that that curve is declining now. And it's not because people are tired of uh, establishing protected areas or don't want more protected areas. It's because the planet is becoming a crowded place. And in many areas, most areas of the planet, the scope for creating new protected areas is very slight. It's a very difficult thing to do. We heard the other day uh, that they're in the process of establishing new protected areas here. And that's a big challenge anywhere. Uh, but, you know, fortunate that, you know, actually I think you're fortunate to be able to be even considering cons uh, establishing new protected areas because it's becoming more and more difficult to do. And so this decline in the number of protected areas is going to continue in the future because there just isn't natural habitat out there that hasn't already been put in protected areas or converted to agriculture or other human land uses. So we're operating in a world in which uh, human population is growing, people need to be fed, um, human land uses are expanding, and natural habitats are shrinking. So Bilal and I might not agree on this point because Bilal seems to think that 100,000 protected areas is a lot of protected areas. I would focus instead on the area of protect that's under protection globally, which is around 10 percent, 10 or 12 percent of the planet is in protected areas. And what this declining part of the curve means is that we're not going to get a lot more than that in protected areas uh, in the next 50 years. So we'll be working, all of us will be working in the next couple of decades in an, in an era in which it's increasingly difficult to establish new protected areas and we'll largely be dealing with the protected areas that we have. And that's appropriate for this course because we're going to talk about how you manage uh, existing protected areas. But it's important to keep in mind, I think, as we do our work, that if we have opportunities to establish new protected areas, those are very rare opportunities and they won't be staying around very long. Um, and we just need to be aware of that so that we can act on those opportunities if there are opportunities to create new protected areas or to not be too discouraged if it seems like we live in a place where all the protected areas that can be established have been established and we won't be able to get any more because in many, many places on the planet that will be the, the condition. Okay, um, so what do we do once we have established protected areas and we need to manage them? Well, Bilal j jumped into a lot of detail about what can happen and how complex it can become and I think showed us that it is very important to try and understand that complexity. But in its simplest form, protected areas are land use controls. So they are legal instruments that say that only certain land uses are permitted in an area. So as we think about this world in which more and more of the planet is being devoted to human uses, we can sort of picture a satellite image of, the, of a region in which the agricultural areas are obvious, and if it's a forested region, then a few areas of forest will stand out in that satellite image, and those are likely where the protected areas are, because protected areas do work, and you will find forest in the places where protected areas are uh, if they're doing their job well. And there might be a few areas where you see forest in the landscape or natural habitats in the landscape that aren't protected areas and those are the opportunities. And so we'll be looking a bit at how we, we think about G, GPS and GIS as ways to, to help us map and, and look at those areas. But as we get to managing protected areas, the, the fundamental thing is that protected areas are a legal instrument that restricts human use of some areas. And that's the fundamental thing that we deal with as we deal with protected area management is a, a legal restriction and it can be imposed by the national government, it can be imposed by local communities, but there needs to be a restriction on human land uses or more than likely uh, human uses of the land will convert natural habitat into agriculture or drain wetlands as in the Mexico City example or in other ways convert natural habitats to human uses and that's just sort of the way the world works. You know, people want to do things and grow crops and make money 
And if places are available to do that, people will take those actions. And so protected areas pr provide legal framework to, that says, no, we're not going to allow certain land uses in these areas. Now, there are many kinds of protected areas. So some protected areas may say that pastoral uses of this land are permitted, and, uh, but you know, permanent agriculture isn't permitted. Or the protected areas may say, well, you know, this is a strict nature reserve. We're not even going to allow tourism here. So there are varying degrees of restriction on human uses, but the, it all has to do with restricting human uses. And w when we see it in that light, we realize that the essence of protected area management has to do with governance and law enforcement. And so um, there can be conflicts that have to do with law enforcement, and that some of those may have some very unpleasant consequences, but ultimately a lot of protected area management has to do with good governance, trying to respect the laws that are in place, um, and law enforcement. Ultimately, someone may have to go to people who want to do something in a protected area, whether it's a local farmer or a multinational oil company, and say, no, this is a protected area, and you're not supposed to be oil drilling here, or you're not supposed to be clearing land to, to plant crops here. And, um, and those law enforcement actions then uh, are usually the domain of government and are a very important part of protected areas management. So let's, let's take a couple of examples then. So the first example I want to give, and I don't have any slides, I have beautiful slides of Madagascar and I will show them soon, uh, but my internet wasn't working. Um, last night, so full disclosure, my slides will come later uh, because I didn't get into the internet last night. But in Madagascar, um, there was a period in which um, especially international development donors got interested in conservation and they funded large projects to help stabilize protected areas in Madagascar and they were these uh, integrated conservation and development projects that uh, Bilal referred to on the first day. Uh, and those projects came about because Madagascar is unique biologically. So the biologists did their homework. They listened to people like Town who knew where the unique species were in the world. And they realized that there were very many of them in Madagascar. And they wanted to be able to begin to protect natural habitats, mostly forests, dry forest and wet forest, and dry spiny desert in Madagascar. Um, but Madagascar is also one of the world's poorest countries, so it was pretty clear that going in and just restricting land use and doing law enforcement as a way of doing protected areas wasn't going to be a particularly socially palatable way to do business, and especially not for international development donors. Uh, the international funding was needed because Madagascar is one of the world's five poorest countries. It has been every year for the past 50 years. It's one of the only countries in the world that's had a declining real uh, standard of living every year for the last 20 years. And so development donors in Madagascar were very concerned about, and rightfully so, about development. But they were also interested in conserving these unique biological resources. And as a result, they began a program of supporting these integrated conservation and development projects that were centered on protected areas but involved communities around protected areas, uh, improved enforcement of the protected areas, but also improved uh, development opportunities for communities around the protected areas. The projects were generally administered by NGOs, Conservation International, where I work was one of those NGOs, and we had several protected areas that we were administering with international development funding in Madagascar. Um, the law enforcement side of these projects uh, was pretty simple, really. There was almost no um, enforcement. There were protected areas in Madagascar, both forest reserves and national parks that already existed, as well, and strict nature reserves as well. But there was virtually no enforcement in any of them. The uh, Department of Waters and Forests was the government agency responsible. Uh, for enforcing forestry and protected areas laws. Uh, they have very small staffs. Uh, their staffs were generally in the regional capitals. There was generally one regional forester who was a trained professional forester who had the legal authority to actually go out and um, 
write people, uh, it's called procès verbal in, in French, to, to basically to write tickets or to arrest people for infractions of the forestry codes. So you'd have, in general, one person in a regional capital th that was authorized to do that, and they would have 10 or 12 people who worked with them who would go out and, and observe things and, and enforce things. And so in that setting, there were no um, park managers or forest managers anywhere near the people that were using forests. And as a result, there was a very uh, high rate of deforestation both in uh, forest reserves and in national parks. And so one of the first things that all of the ICDPs did when they got on the ground was establish a field presence near the protected area. So there would, would be a project headquarters, there would actually be functioning vehicles that could get people back and forth to the protected area. So some ba very basic infrastructure was set up. And um, that helped the enforcement side of the equation a lot. And interestingly, it also helped the community relations side of park management in Madagascar. And that was something I think we didn't really expect. But we knew that there was very little law enforcement going on in, in reserves in Madagascar. And so as these projects were set up, all of the NGOs running them knew that they had to improve uh, administration of the forest laws and, and enforcement. And I think in general, people expected that there would be a backlash because of that, because we assumed that there had been no um, sort of enforcement of laws and people were doing whatever they wanted. And when uh, projects came in and regularized things and got more regulation and enforcement in place, then local communities wouldn't be happy with that. Um, and quite to our surprise, when these projects went in and improved enforcement, local communities were in general actually very receptive to that and happy. And the reason was that the regional forestry officials, who generally never got out to the field and didn't see things, were issuing permits for clearing to people who were coming out generally from the regional capital and showed up with permits to do things that local people knew that they weren't allowed to do and that the forestry officers would come out and give them a hard time about if they did them. So, in fact, much of the illegal activity and forest clearing that had been going on was going on by sort of more regional entities. There's certainly a lot of forest clearing in areas where they practice Swidden agriculture, and that's sort of a different part of the story. But there was a lot of forest clearing going on uh, from people who were really coming in from outside, from nearby cities, um, to do either logging or, or um, clearing of forests for agriculture. And when, and when those things got cleaned up, in general, local communities were receptive to that. And rather than having problems with local community relations as a result of improving enforcement, we actually found the relationships with communities around the forest were improved. Um, the other part of enforcement, though, had to do with people who were Swidden agriculturalists who practiced field fallows that rotated, and these weren't permitted by, fairly or unfairly, by the regional forestry officials. And something had to be done to acknowledge the fact that many parks had lost large areas to forest clearing as people were clearing new land to grow food. And so, in general, the approach to that problem was to redefine the park boundaries because it was pretty clear that people were inside the old park boundaries, which had existed since the 30s or 40s, and that they hadn't been consulted or even really talked to about park administration for decades. And there wasn't going to be any, you know, regrowing forest and pushing the park boundaries back out. And so a process was begun of re redelineating uh, protected area boundaries to exclude areas that had been excised, to involve communities in those discussions so that they understood where the forest boundaries are. And sometimes the boundary of the park was right in the middle of an agricultural field somewhere. And the idea was that the, the land on the other side that was within the park would try to be restored and that the land on the, on the community side would be available for agriculture. And, and that process went reasonably well as well, I think. Um, in terms of the community development activities, the community development activities went great because these were generally well-funded projects that had quite a lot of money to do community development. And they did um, all sorts of different things for communities, from building schools to putting in wells um, to replacing roofs when the cyclones came through. And those are things that communities loved and were happy to have happen. And um, 
at least in the time the projects existed, uh, continued to build a lot of goodwill with communities. <laughs> what wasn't necessarily successful about those community activities, though, was trying to build a link between the community activities and conservation. So building a school is a great thing for a community, and if the community sees an NGO that's working with the Parks Authority build a school, well, they like that, and that builds goodwill. But it doesn't necessarily take the pressure off from the families that are thinking about clearing land to grow more food in the park or going into the park to gather in Madagascar in the drier areas. They gather a tuber called masiba, which is sort of a, like a giant sweet potato. And, um, and so, you know, dealing with those sorts of uses of the park um, didn't really get addressed through the community activities. And uh, a guy named Paul Ferraro spent several years in Madagascar documenting the attempts to get community activities to actually lead to conservation. And he did a really good job of documenting that even very intelligently designed community development activities often did not result in improved conservation because it's just very difficult to get the link from community activities back to conservation. So one example of that was in southern Madagascar, they were cutting uh, tree ferns to make uh, pots for plants out of. And so people would sell these by the side of the road. You'd cut down a, a palm, a tree fern, and hollow it out. And they make great pots because they're hollow and spongy and hold water. And people were selling these by the side of the road. But it was a big conservation problem because it was resulting in the, the tree ferns being taken out of the forest. And so one of the ICDPs, designed a community uh, development activity that would get people the equivalent amount of income that they were making from selling tree fern pots and actually was designed to use their labor in the same time of year that they would usually go out to harvest the tree, fern, tree ferns to make pots so that it both gave them an alternative income and used their labor in the time of year when they would be going out to, to do this uh, illegal activity. Uh, so it looked like a great win, but when Paul Ferraro went and looked at that, he discovered that what happened was that the people that were involved in that program used the income that they got from the alternative uh, livelihood program to hire other people to go out and harvest tree ferns and hollow them out and sell them by the road. So there are not a lot, when Bilal says you know, that there's sort of no evidence of ICDPs, doing any good. I don't, I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot of evidence that ICDPs did good conservation work and improved the uh, reduced deforestation and, and uh, helped improve the integrity of protected areas. I think ICDPs did a lot of good community work. Uh, the communities were very thankful to have seen the project in their areas. And it was nice that people who live around protected areas, which are sometimes very isolated and, and don't have a lot of services, did benefit from these development activities. But where ICDPs weren't terribly successful was in creating community uh, livelihood activities that would actually directly result in conservation. So that was sort of the lesson from uh, Madagascar's uh, um, ICDP experience. And uh, towns showed some recent expansions in, in Madagascar's protected area state. Uh, in case ever anyone is impressed that a, a nation can triple its protected areas as state uh, when it's so difficult to get protected areas established other places, just know that those new protected areas in Madagascar were generally new national parks and almost all of them were converted from forest reserves. So it wasn't uh, a big expansion of protected areas into areas that hadn't been protected at all, but it was rather a conversion of forest reserves into national parks and reserves. So don't lose, you know, don't lose heart if it wouldn't seem like you could triple the national park estate in, in your country, uh, because Madagascar couldn't either. But they could take uh, reserves that were forest reserves and convert them into more restrictive land use categories. And then I promised a second um, example. I already talked about Botswana a little bit. Um, but I think Botswana is an, an interesting second quick example to give uh, because something really interesting happened in Botswana last year and that is that Botswana banned all hunting. And hunting was a theme that came up in our symposium day as well. And so um, I think it's interesting to, to bring it up. Poaching came up as well. Uh, but Botswana decided to ban all hunting within its borders, including safari hunting, 
where rich international tourists come in and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to shoot a trophy animal, and citizen hunting, which was generally small-scale hunting for um, meat consumption. So why did this happen in Botswana, and why, why is it interesting that it happened in Botswana? Well, it's interesting that it happened in Botswana because Botswana is one of the countries in Africa with the best governance, certainly in southern Africa, one of the countries with the best governance record around, a very stable government, very strong wildlife department, and a uh, military that gets involved in anti-poaching uh, affairs on a regular basis. So this is a country that has, you would think, has hunting completely wired and under control. Um, in point of fact, and it's also a good example because it's a place where scientific information came in and changed policy in a big way. The hunting ban in Botswana came about because they did their uh, wildlife census and discovered that wildlife populations in Botswana had declined by 80% in the last 15 years. So there'd been a huge decline in wildlife populations in Botswana in a country that has excellent anti-poaching capabilities and a hunting license uh, system that's computerized and should be completely transparent and well managed. Um, but what had happened in Botswana is that the country had become increasingly urbanized. Uh, citizen hunting permits uh, were given out, but many people didn't use the hunting permits themselves and it was legal to onward sell the hunting permits. And people in Botswana wanted the money from the hunting permits, so they sold, uh, maybe this is similar to the, the Maasai taking advantage of income that they could get in the short term from uh, subdivided uh, ranch lands. But at any rate, um, most people in Botswana weren't using the hunting licenses in themselves. They were selling them to companies who went out and hunted out uh, antelope for, for game meat, essentially. And those companies actually turned out to be South African com companies that were feeding, uh, that were satisfying the biltong trade in South Africa. So it's interesting, I think, maybe for West Africans where we hear about bushmeat trade in West Africa, but in Southern Africa, bushmeat trade is very much alive and well, and it's feeding a big bushmeat uh, trade in South Africa, which is, you know, little biltong, uh, for people that don't know, biltong is beef jerky. I don't know what other names of it are, but it's dry, you know, it's dried meat. It's bushmeat, dried bushmeat. And in South Africa, you get a nice little packet like you'd get beef jerky in the U.S and it's a dried meat snack and it's really popular and there's a huge demand for it. And what was happening was South African companies were coming up to Botswana, buying up citizen hunting licenses, which was legal, were using the citizen hunting licenses, but also overusing them because there, it was very difficult to monitor hunting in remote areas and the companies were coming out with dried meat rather than carcasses or something that could be easily monitored. And as a result, you had really large declines in all sorts of uh, wildlife across Botswana. Not elephants, not the things that we think about getting poached usually, uh, but just ordinary antelopes and, uh, and other species that the Biltong companies were interested in taking out. And so that decision then went to the president and the president finally decided to ban hunting entirely. And it was partly an equity issue. <coughs> they could have banned citizen hunting because that was a, apparently the big cause of the wildlife declines, uh, but they, that wouldn't have been very politically popular. And so they banned safari hunting as well. Well, it's, there's gonna be quite a bit of income lost in Botswana to safari hunting. Um, as a result of this decision because people do spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to come and shoot trophy animals. But on the other hand, citizen, citizens in Botswana are losing what was essentially a government subvention. They were getting a citizen hunting license that they could sell, which, and I don't know what they sold for, but you know, it meant that government was handing you something that was essentially a check that you could cash by taking it to a hunting company and getting money back. So citizen, citizens who got hunting licenses obviously were gonna be unhappy in Botswana, and I think the political decision was, well, then let's make everybody unhappy and not have rich people coming in who are able to hunt when citizens aren't allowed to hunt anymore. So the hunting ban is on in Botswana. Uh, we'll, we'll see what it means, but it's interesting that even in a country that has excellent law enforcement and good governance, you can wind up with a situation where you have surprising declines in wildlife, and their solution has been to ban hunting. The other possibility in Botswana is that veterinary fences that have been put up uh, to subdivide the country's cattle areas may actually be, be driving a lot of the decline in wildlife. So 
the science isn't entirely in yet. We know there's been a huge decline in, in wildlife numbers in Botswana, and it's, it's certain that the, the, the resale and misuse of citizen hunting licenses was contributing to that. But it may also be true that fencing of open ranges is, is a major contributing factor as well. So those are just two examples from two very different places, the forest setting in Madagascar, uh, a more uh, semi-arid uh, savanna, Botswana, and uh, happy to take any questions people might have. <laughs>